About 10 years ago, before we began production on Jonathan Bird's Blue World, I was up in the Bay of Fundy in Canada photographing basking sharks, which are the second largest fish on Earth. I noticed that all of the sharks had these long, slimy, skinny fish stuck to their skin. I didn't know what they were. So I plucked one off the skin of the shark, took it back to the boat, and took some pictures of its face. I figured out that it was a parasitic lamprey. I didn't really think much of it, so I threw it back in the water and went home with my pictures. A few months later, I got a phone call from Dr. Stephen Turnbull, a marine biologist at the University of New Brunswick, and he wanted to talk to me about this. He'd heard about it from the fishermen. Turns out that I had made a new discovery. Shark biologists did not think that lampreys could live on sharks. So the following summer, we took the research boat from the University of New Brunswick back to the Bay of Fundy on an expedition to investigate. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird, and welcome to my world. It's a beautiful summer morning in Atlantic Canada. As the sun rises at 5 a.m., the fog blows off the water and I head down to the dock to meet my ride. We begin loading the Mary O, a research boat from the University of New Brunswick. Shark biologist Steve Turnbull is aboard, hoping to gather first-hand proof that basking sharks in the Bay of Fundy have lampreys on them. Also aboard is lamprey biologist Dr. Mike Wilkie, who has brought all kinds of scientific equipment to test the lampreys, assuming we find any. We're heading out into the middle of the Bay of Fundy, a long stretch of water between mainland Canada and Nova Scotia. It has the highest tides in the world and a huge amount of plankton. Plankton is food for many animals in the ocean. The word plankton means drifter, so anything drifting is planktonic. These tiny copepods are planktonic crustaceans, smaller than a grain of rice. More than a quarter of a million of them could fit into a coffee cup. They might not seem like much, but they're the main food source for the basking shark, which swims through the water with its mouth wide open to filter them out of the water by the millions. Basking sharks are the second largest fish on Earth, reaching 45 feet long. That makes them longer than a school bus. That is one big shark. But since they feed only on plankton, they're no threat to people at all. In fact, a basking shark's throat is only about the size of a grapefruit. It can't swallow anything bigger than that. With the boat finally loaded with all our gear, we push off the dock and head out towards the sharks. Passing the beautiful shoreline of Atlantic Canada reminds me that this is one of the most serene and peaceful places on Earth, even if the water is a bit cold. Our travels take us past the lighthouse on Grand Manan Island and finally out into the open water of the Bay of Fundy. We're soon joined by a pod of Atlantic white-sided dolphins riding our bow wave. Dolphins are always fun and add to the enjoyment of being at sea. Further out, we find whales. These are not just any whales, but northern right whales, the most endangered whales on Earth. There are only 300 of them left in existence. Finding them is a good sign because they eat the same copepods that basking sharks eat. If the whales are here, the sharks probably are too. We all grab binoculars and start scanning the horizon. Basking sharks get their name because they often come to the surface to feed when it's really calm. Sailors used to think they were basking in the sun and that's how they got their name. We see something on the horizon and start heading that way. 
Soon we get closer and the shark dives out of sight. Back to the binoculars. Basking sharks are big fish and they don't need to come to the surface to breathe like whales. So you have to get really lucky to find one close enough to the surface that its dorsal fin sticks out of the water. Without that, we have no hope of finding any. At last we find another shark and manage to sneak the boat up nearby. The shark is just cruising slowly feeding on the plankton. We jump in the inflatable and head out with cameras to see if it has a lamprey on its back. We approach as close as we can and roll off the boat. An enormous shark passes below us in the green soupy water. The thick plankton makes the visibility bad, but that's why the sharks are here. It's pretty spooky. I see a lamprey on the shark as it goes by, but I'm not deep enough to grab it. We have a theory, which is that it seems like you guys are getting closer than we are with the boat. And I think because we have an outboard and it's really loud underwater, and you guys have an exhaust up out of the water, I think this boat is actually quieter to the shark. We decide to bring the Mario up alongside a shark. They seem to react a lot better to this than the inflatable. On the next attempt, I jump into the water and get some good video of the lampreys on a shark. I'm incredibly excited that I finally have proof for the biologists that these sharks have lampreys on them. Now the hard part. Our team takes turns trying to grab a lamprey and get it to the surface. I manage to get one with one hand while holding my video camera in the other. I'm ready. landing that here. Put the net in the water. I got him. All right. Got one. Yay! Thank you. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, Mike begins getting his apparatus together. That is a parasitic lamprey taken right off of a basking shark. That is impressive. I'm not sure this has ever been done before. He wants to find out how the lampreys can handle the toxic blood of the shark. I need the lid here, actually. There it is. This insert will keep the animal inside the box. Sharks have a lot of urea in their blood, which is why biologists used to think that sharks could not have lampreys on them. Lampreys have a terrible looking oral disc instead of a jaw, used to drill a hole in a fish and drink their blood like vampires. Yeah, you can see bits of tissue still in there, right? He's definitely feeding. If they're drinking the shark's blood, then they're getting what biologists consider a deadly dose of toxic urea. So Mike wants to find out if they're really drinking the shark's blood or just getting a free ride. And if they are drinking the shark's blood, how do they deal with the urea? The lamprey doesn't seem very happy about being confined to a tiny little tray full of water. We discuss the capture of the first lamprey and how we may go about getting another one. Behind the dorsal fin, probably closer to the caudal fin on the top of his body, you know, right before his tail. There were two of them right next to each other. If he was actually feeding on the basking shark, my guess is his metabolic rate is going through the roof right now. He'd be producing waste like crazy. Yeah. Later in the day, after many more attempts, I was able to grab another lamprey off a shark. Four. Okay, I am putting them in. There's the lid. He is bigger. 
is huge. We observe the two very active lampreys in the cooler. One of them really wants to attach to something. With two lampreys aboard, we call it a day and head for the dock. Mike's research showed that the lampreys are, in fact, drinking the shark's blood, and it turns out they have powerful kidneys that can filter out the toxic urea. This only goes to show that one simple photograph of something unexpected can lead to an amazing new discovery about life in the ocean. Who knows how many more discoveries await us in the sea? I'm keeping my eyes peeled as I continue to explore the blue world.